everybody. This is Robin Ayu from the Localization Fireside Chat. And today, uh, welcome for another uh, episode, for another recording. Today, we are recording episode number 78 on the channel. And um, just uh, news to everybody, the, I'm celebrating today. Actually, there is a 280,000 views in total on the channel. And uh, somebody in the industry just uh, ran a statistics on all the YouTube channels are in the industry. And uh, fortunately, uh, my uh, YouTube channel, the Localization Fireside Chat, which is started in March 2023, has now ranked uh, number 11 in the entire industry, which is pretty significant achievement knowing that we don't i don't have a marketing department supporting me i don't have a large budget pushing this forward i call it the uh, fuel of passion that's that's what it is that is pushing me forward on this one so again to the panel that I, we have today and to the audience welcome to another episode welcome to this recording today's topic is going to be medical interpretation and the importance of the profession of medical interpretation in when it comes to life-saving conversations that the patient and the doctor the service provider are having together and the enabling of those conversations to go in the right direction. Most patients are, or most uh, health service provi uh, providers don't speak each other's language in some cases. And this is where this is where this particular conversation that we're gonna be having today, it's uh, very important. The conversation that we're having today, it's not new. It's not the first one that we've had. We've had another conversation about uh, two months ago now. It's on the channel with the uh, panel that you have in front of you. This is a continuation of what the um, the previous episode that we've recorded. Uh, feel free to check out our uh, past recording of this same topic. And to help me guide me through the conversation today, I'm honored to have with me uh, the lady that we've had before with us on the call. And um, for those who don't know you, if you don't mind, let's start with a round of introduction. We'll start with Natalia. If you don't mind, Natalia, introduce yourself and then go to Ginny, Erisa, and Mila. Go ahead, Natalia. Hi, everyone. And Robin, <laughs> thank you for inviting us back. Uh, and my uh, fuel for passion is like lang languages. I love languages. So I started my career as teaching them both at high school level, then university level back in a southern uh, city in the Russian Federation. And when I moved to this country, my first job was coordinating interpreting and translation services for a refugee resettlement agency. And this is where I discovered how uh, difficult it is to learn a language when it wasn't your passion from, you know, childhood and how to become an interpreter is actually, you know, you need to follow certain steps, certain paths. And I developed at that point some trainings for refugees who are brand new to the United States and who speak some English, but they don't know anything about interpreting yet. Uh, and soon during that, you know, uh, work, uh, I realized that uh, the crown for any profession is actually certification and the profession exists on the map, on the radar of the, you know, uh, HR, uh, on the radar of industry, if it has some standard that you can compare against. And that's why I volunteered for and was one of the founding commissioners for the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters, CCHI. And here I am for the 15th year uh, with them and uh, for the 10th here, I'm the executive director of CCHI. Well, welcome. Uh, nice to have you with us. Jeannie? Hello, Robin. Thank you so much for having me back and uh, in this great company. I'm Jeannie Bromberg. I uh, started out as a freelance interpreter in the industry, uh, and I'm actually a court certified interpreter, though I don't get to practice, unfortunately, as much as I would like to because interpreting is my passion. Um, I run two companies. Bromberg and Associates. I'm the founder and president of uh, our language and technology solutions company. We're working over 200 languages. And healthcare is definitely one of our important sectors. Our second company, and the one that started out of, I have to say, uh, out of sheer frustration with the lack of uh, training options at that point, um, was Linguist Education Online. Initially, the title of the company, the name was Interpreter Education Online, but later on we rebranded to reflect the growing array of uh, training options. And today we do training, testing, and since 2020, we started doing conferences 
for uh, the industry, everything online. And in addition to that, I'm happy to give back to the industry. I am uh, on the board of Association of Language Companies, and I also chair Language Access Committee through the ALC. So it's my pleasure to be here. Excellent. Well, thanks uh, for uh, joining us uh, today, uh, Jeannie. Erissa, good to see you again. Hey, hello, everybody. It's great, actually, to be back. So thank you. The reason that you invited us is because we did a great episode last time, I guess. So thank you for having us again. It's a pleasure again. It's an honor to be here with the amazing ladies that I admire very much. So I started in this industry um, from the other side. I was a medical student, so I was not... Um, I spoke Albanian because I was born and raised there and I moved to United States with a dream to help people. But then I, by coincidence, I was introduced to the profession. I fell in love and my passion, my fuel of passion is not only to serve the client, to help the, the people who do not speak the language in United States or everywhere, but also to help the, to help the linguist, because I think that my mission in this industry is to bring this great opportunity to serve globally, because there are many, many linguists worldwide that would love to learn, uh, would love to get trained, certified, and help connect the communication between language barriers. So I run Lingua Survey with a mission to, to promote linguist uh, interpretation worldwide and also serve U.S. patients and U.S. companies as well. Thank you. Thank you, Arissa. Thanks for joining us this morning. Mila. Well, thank you for having us, especially for the second time. Um, I, too, started years ago as an interpreter. Certification did not exist in this country at that time. It was a big shock for me. And uh, I actually uh, seeked a, a, a version of what would be a certification and took the State Department exam as a way to show that I'm actually a professional working in this industry was the only thing uh, available at the time besides court, court certification for Spanish and Navajo. But that wasn't my language at the time, or nor is it now. So uh, years ago, started as an interpreter, and uh, today I'm uh, the founder and the president of Masterword. Uh, we work in over 450 languages because we have a very strong emphasis on marginalized languages. And we started uh, what has now become Masterword Institute years ago, and we have a lot of different training programs and training options for interpreters. We very much support CCHI and partner with CCHI and we're thrilled that now CCHI has a new exam for that covers marginalized languages. So we'll be outsourcing more of our tests <laughs> or looking for CCHI certification for all of the, the languages. <laughs> And uh, one of uh, the, the focuses of uh, my work uh, or volunteer work has been, in addition to founding Global Coalition for Language Rights, also focusing on vicarious trauma that affects a lot of interpreters and with the goal of educating as many interpreters on the topic. Uh, Trauma-informed interpreting, cannot talk about it enough with the epidemic of trauma, how important that is, uh, and then uh, interpreting in uh, the, the field of human uh, trafficking and trauma survivors, again, survivors of violence, working with refugees, we, we see a lot of that in our everyday work. So healthcare interpreting is critical to the lives of well, thank you very much, uh, Mila, for joining us as well. Uh, thank you, ladies, for joining us again, uh, back by popular demand. Uh, we restart the conversation and we expand on what we've started talking about. Uh, this is an indicative of how important this topic it, it is for many people, many uh, for many on many levels. So, one of the things that I would like to uh, get us started in terms of uh, this particular conversation today is let's talk a little bit about medical interpretation in the U.S. today? Like, I know you guys, uh, you ladies operate in variety of uh, states. Uh, I don't know if you cover, you know, coast to coast, uh, the ser your services. Do you have like a specific jurisdiction that you operate in? Or do you have a specific medical practice that you offer services in or all medical practices? Um, and where does it fit from a you know, the other, med the other side of, you know, the other branches of medical uh, interpretation would be, for instance, one is mental health. 
would be his uh, physiotherapy, uh, would be on all the other extended benefits of healthcare, if you will, not necessarily just the hardcore one, you know, the, the one that you have to actually sit down and explain an illness per se, a physical illness. Uh, let's start with um, Natalia and we'll do a round on, the, on that topic. Just give us your opinion, if you don't mind, on what I just uh, uh, commented. You know, I mean, this is a, a, a good question. Uh, we're a national organization because from day one, uh, we thought that it's important uh, that medical interpreters have one standard regardless of what state they're in, in the United States. Uh, because uh, especially with, the, at that time, the onset of remote interpreting, video remote interpreting, it truly really is important. You never know whether you interpret interpreter you are getting being in rural area of Ohio, if that interpreter is from Ohio or if they are from the state of Washington or maybe even Canada, right? So mm -hmm. for that reason, we have this national certification that is the same for every language and every interpreter. On top of that, you brought up a very important part. Medical interpreting is not just talking to a doctor when you have like, you know, uh, come to get a vaccine or when your child has an earache, right? Uh, medical interpreting is healthcare in general, and it may be mental health, dental, physical therapy. And so on our exams, uh, obviously we cannot cover every single thing, but because we update our exams like regularly uh, every other year, we do have sections that touch upon terminology of all aspects. And the same thing with our practical exam, we have dialogues from different uh, specialties of healthcare. And that's why our brand is healthcare interpreting rather than narrow word of clinical medical interpreting. And that's, I think it's important because uh, you may start as a staff interpreter in a hospital and think that's what you'll do all your life, but that doesn't happen that way. And so tomorrow you may be doing something completely different. I'll stop here. Absolutely. Thank you. Natalia. Ginny, uh, any comments on your side on the uh, comments here? If I can just unmute, then I can <laughs> comment. Yes. Um, well, definitely. And I think that the profession has advanced quite a bit in comparison to like thinking back 20 years ago when I would see uh, janitors and cafeteria workers who happen to be bilingual being pulled to interpret, uh, you know, delivery, mental health, any type of an appointment. I'm not saying that it's not happening today, but because it is, unfortunately. But I think the extent to which it is happening today is nothing to compare to what it used to be. So profession has made a lot of progress, a lot of strides with certification, with interpreters who are at least core certified. If they don't have CHI, they can have core CHI. Um, so it is getting better. There is a lot more awareness in the industry with regards to hard skills, soft skills, and uh, specializations. So that I think is a great step. There are also some challenges, obviously, and we're not where we do need to be. So there is so much more work that needs to be done with regards to advancing the profession. And I'll stop here because I'm sure that uh, both uh, Mila and Arisa can add a lot more. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, Arisa? Yes. So I, I'm an interpreter myself. So I will uh, uh, share with you a story that happened recently that kind of brought me very, very joy because there was a doctor that asked the patient, why didn't you bring your daughter to, in, to help us communicate? And the patient said, no, I like the interpreter better because they interpret the medical terminology much better than my daughter. And I felt like, yes, this is what we're talking about. This is what we have to strive every day to make a difference, not just to help them understand, but to the level of communication that the patient feels secure, feels safe that they can trust the person on the other side interpreting for them. And a family member or a bilingual person cannot offer that. So to reach to that level, we definitely need standards, we definitely need more training, and we need more support for our interpreters because interpreters have the passion to help. But in order to be to the quality that this profession requires, we need to provide all the resources. And thank God we have companies um, that provide this training, like Genius Companies or Mila's Companies, that help interpreters learn more, grow more, and then go certify them and be you know, accredited nationwide. 
So I think I agree with Jeannie that there is a lot more to be done, especially when we go back to my sweet spot, international global resources. Those are a little bit more like a way taking consideration where the U.S. interpreters are. So we need to close this gap. We need to make standards, not only national, why not international? Because healthcare interpreting is viable anywhere. Great. Uh, thanks, Arissa. Mila, what's your take on this? Well, I will be adding to it. We, we work nationally and we work across all parts of, of healthcare. So, uh, and yes, there's been progress in, in healthcare. However, there was a, a great presentation at, at CCHI uh, conference that talked about how even within healthcare, what percentage of uh, doctors don't know and don't even call an interpreter into an encounter. But if we go outside of the hospital setting, uh, we have a lot of work to do educating the clients about using the interpreters and how to, to work with interpreters. So uh, there's still a lot of work, work to be done. <clears throat> I also think that at this point, um, while we have done a lot of work establishing certification and there's a lot that falls on interpreters to continue education. For example, um, I was preparing a training course on how to interpret in, in synergetic place therapy settings. In order to do that, I took a six months full-time pretty much training course uh, with synergetic play therapy professionals to understand the field. So as we're stepping forward, moving forward, there'll be even more requirements on interpreters to improve their skills. And especially, and I'm going to talk, touch that topic as we as in the age of AI, we're not stepping into the age of AI, we're in the age of AI. So now we are also in a way competing with AI um, in the mind of a provider who goes, why don't I just get here ChatGPT or Google Translate and, and use that to, to uh, facilitate communication? So we have a, a new challenge uh, that centered our industry. Absolutely. So the next, um, the next, you know, we're going to save that AI uh, question to the uh, just a little down the road in our conversation, but my next topic that I'd like to bring to the uh, panel is, uh, for those who don't know, um, what is the mechanics like, um, like uh, from a from a providing the service perspective? So, for instance, if I was, you know, who do you sell to? Do you sell to the hospital? Do you sell to the doctor? Um, do you sign a contract with the hospital? Do you sign a contract with the medical system in the state that you're in? Um, how do you, who is your customer A? And B, how do they book a uh, an interpreter, for instance? Do you guys have a, a software that they log into and book an interpreter or they phone you? Um, are the interpreter needs to be flown into some location or are they they live handy around the area where the service is being provided? Um, and, and those are the mechanics of providing the service, I guess. Can we go around just to, just to get an idea of how the, how the service is provided and who do you sell it to and how do they book it? and for instance, what is the minimum rate? Like, is there a minimum rate? Uh, you know, do you pay them per hour? If I were the interpreter, can I make a living being an interpreter? Or am I going to get one assignment per week and that's it? Uh, how does that work? Well, uh, Jenny, I'll let you do the second part and the others, but I'll say, say all of the above, Robin. So we sell to hospital systems. We sell uh, to uh, individual hospitals and individual doctors. The, the options for having a contract are all of the above, and the options for booking the service are all of the above. Most companies today um, have a software where there's a portal, where you log into a portal, you request a service. Some organizations and some uh, groups, they call in, they prefer to call in, others prefer to log in through the portal. And so as far as being able to access the service, companies in the industry today provide a lot of, of technology. And uh, I'll let the rest of the group cover the other answers. I can continue on what Mila was talking about. And yes, all of the above is exactly the same answer for us. Um, we do offer uh, software technology for, uh, for our clients. Um, and 
they can log in request services through the portal. Uh, we do provide services remotely on site, however the client needs. It is rare on our end because we do work with government and healthcare entities that they would approve somebody to be flown in, but they would rather figure out, or we would rather help them figure out options to deliver services remotely. But uh, with regards to making a living, I think um, it depends on um, the language peers that the interpreter works in, whether they're open to working remotely on site, whether they are flexible with how much work they want to put in. It definitely is an opportunity to make a good living for someone who is trained, certified, specializing, and mm -hmm. willing to continue lifelong learning in this career. Absolutely. So for someone who takes it seriously as their career, Yes, they can make a like anything like any okay. other career, right, Jeannie? Exactly. Like any other career. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so who pays for the service? Uh, is it the patient? Is it the doctor? Who pays for the service? So may I? Go ahead. Legally, we have laws in the US that require language provision to be offered by hospitals, by healthcare organizations, by any federally uh, subsidized organizations to the patients and now to their families as well. We just recently had uh, the final ruling for section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act go into effect, actually just a little over a month ago. And it expanded the uh, requirements quite a bit. So uh, now, uh, for instance, Medicare Part B, so smaller providers, smaller clinics are now covered as well. Okay. And they are supposed to I... provide uh, proactively uh, language access. And if I can jump in here, so what it means is that in the US, patients do not have to pay for interpreters. You know, it's a responsibility of any provider of any health systems. Uh, I also want to add to your conversation, you were talking uh, both Mila and uh, Jeannie of about one part of our workforce as medical interpreters, which are freelancers. Uh, it's important to recognize that in the US, it's pretty much 50-50 split now, at least according to the surveys that we run at our organization. The other 50% are staff interpreters because health systems, especially in large metropolitan areas where there are patients of a kind of rather narrow uh, type of languages, like maybe five, eight languages. And of course, regionally, it could be like in the state of Texas, it could be just one language, Spanish, right? Uh, so um, they have staff interpreters. And if you're a staff interpreter, then you follow the same and get the same benefits as any employee of a health system. So that way you can definitely make a good living. You have health insurance and all the other, you know, bells and whistles that come with that uh, retirement, etc. So that's one aspect. But it is rather limited number of jobs uh, because smaller hospitals and smaller clinics will not have staff interpreters. So that's why I think uh, we have uh, like three types of uh, interpreters in the country. Uh, staff, full-time, go to job, come back home, do nothing else, right? Fun. After that, it's fun. There's a mixed group, which is they like staff but they are on call and hourly so they could go maybe 20 hours in that main provider and then they supplement it with you know remote interpreting usually call in because they have enough of the face-to-face -face for the day then they sign in and they're different models you can some companies allow you to sign in whenever you're available so if you're available this week two hours you work two hours if you're available this week 40 hours on top of your other 20 you'll do that right and then there is the freelancers that's again it's up to the dedication and desire uh and as far as the making a living um for freelancers you know i worked mostly in my previous job with interpreters of uh languages of lesser diffusion so to say which will be like karen Pali, Mon. Uh, so at some point when we just started resettling refugees for Myanmar in this country, we only had two interpreters who spoke Mon and one of them was in Hawaii, the other one was on the East Coast. And so they had the whole United States and they 
were unfortunately not always available because we have to sleep, right? And at that point, because it's such a rare language, it's the first, and I'm talking about the first year of starting the resettlement of that population, they could definitely get enough, you know, to, to live. But now when we have more of the population, of course, you know, the market takes care of that. So it's a flexible thing. And that's why it's so hard to explain to the providers how we work. And that's why nobody really understands us, even in the United States, because, you know, you talk about this, that, and it's just a nice, uh, you know, mix. But I think it's also a great profession if you are yourself flexible and if you're searching what you want to do. And I'll let Arisa talk about that since, you know, she was the one who found the profession. Go ahead, Arisa. Yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, I agree with everything that has been said, because I want to mention one aspect, considering on how much you invest to become an interpreter. So yeah, you get paid very highly if you're a doctor, because you invest 20 years of your life learning about that profession and a lot of debt to finish medical school. So as an interpreter, you don't have that burden. So at the same time, the correspondence is not as highly, but I agree with Natalia, if you are a full-time staff, the payment and the benefits in U.S. are very similar to everybody else. Uh, the idea here is how you distinguish yourself, because the competition is real, even among interpreters. And just knowing the language or finishing one training course uh, is not enough, and it will never be enough. So one thing that interpreters have to realize in order to compete real and have a fair, you know, advancement, they have to work on their selves or on their journey, on their progression. But uh, one thing is that our industry has a good relationship with technology. So we are very advanced in technology as, as far as I see when I start, and I didn't start very long time ago, but it changed it like automatically, dramatically within like a couple of years. So now in terms of providing our services is very easy. You have a lot of options. You can do video over the phone. You can do in person. You can schedule. You can reach anywhere uh, nationwide and globally as well an interpreter in matters of seconds. You know, we connect in 13 seconds. So that's something unique for doctors to, to save their time. Absolutely. And I want and I want to add to this. So we, we kind of skipped over people who speak rare languages and people who want to work as interpreters for rare languages. I think for any language in our field, uh, there is a requirement for lifelong learning and, and professional development. And I have seen interpreters who speak the most rare languages who actually are flowing in location to location. They kind of, it, the better they become, the more in a way they get a celebrity status. And they are the ones requested for the most important appointments, for the most important assignments. And we see with rare languages where um, appointments are scheduled based on interpreter availability sometimes, not based on the doctor's availability. Court hearing is scheduled based on interpreter's availability, not based on the doctor's availability. And uh, interpreters who pursue uh, that continuous learning, professionalization, for those rare languages, get full-time employment because they become required, uh, requested nationwide and sometimes uh, internationally. You know, this is very insightful and I really, um, I like this conversation where this conversation is going. Uh, you guys are providing a lot of information here for people who are potentially thinking of becoming an interpreter, who are currently an interpreter, it's educational for them as well. And for the people who are requiring the service, just to understand how serious this conversation is, not just because you speak another language, you become an interpreter. There's a lot more to it than, uh, than that. Uh, that's also education. And for the service provider to understand, you know, these are not your, you know, the uh, local uh, support staff that you have in your, in your, in your um, hospital or you're in your healthcare facility that they're doing the job. These are qualified individuals that have been vetted, they've been certified, and they're providing the service. Now, you guys operate in the U.S. The U.S. community in general is a litigious society. I mean, everybody sues everybody. That's the understanding I have of the United States. Any opportunity to sue somebody, the people will take it on. How do you manage that? And, in, in you know, the doctors are being sued, the hospitals are being sued. Uh, what is <clears throat> liability protection or how do you, have you ever been sued uh, from an interpretation perspective? How did you manage that? How did you deal with that? Can somebody talk about that? Actually, let's start round round uh, round round robin discussion on the legal aspect of it. Me who are I 
I can jump in. Uh, so first of all, insurance, you carry insurance. Uh, secondly, it's uh, incredibly tight vetting process. So for we have, uh, unfortunately and fortunately, uh, about uh, initially about 5% right now with more trained interpreters in the industry. And uh, we have about only 15% pass rate. Uh, for pro, pro, so we do look for hiring really professional uh, interpreters. So it's really tight screening, vetting, and um, the onboarding process is very, very important part of that liability management. And I'll pass that on. Let me jump in here. Uh, so we want to. I want to clarify that there are two aspects to lawsuits, right? One is about interpreter doing something wrong, and those are very rare, if they were used a professional interpreter. You know, our, our uh, you know profession unfortunately suffers from the fact that the public would call an interpreter anybody. Right, and we even have the infamous example. I don't know if it's a, you know, uh, widespread across the world, but in the United States, for two decades, we have one example that a hospital was sued because the person became quadriplegic after the interpreter made the mistake of, you know, saying uh, interpreting the word intoxicado as intoxicated instead of poisoned, right? And so, and it was a seven uh, million. Uh, settlement for that thing. But that interpreter was not an interpreter. It was a person who was an emergency responder who was used to interpret at that moment. And so the majority of the lawsuits in the United States in our industry are against the systems and providers who did not utilize professional interpreters or did not provide any interpreters, period. And that one law that just came into effect that Gina mentioned, that Section 1557, now gives the opportunity to for any person and any organization who observes that uh, gap and the interpreter is not provided to sue that health system. So anybody could bring it. It could be a person themselves. It could be an interpreter uh, against the health system that they did not provide the professional one. So that's kind of is the nature of the litigation. And I, to my knowledge, we have not been sued on this call, and any of us. Now, for the CCHI, because we also carry the liability with our exams, our main protection against lawsuits, because certified interpreters carry that brand that they have been tested, is to make sure that our test processes are uh, in compliance with the best scientific methods. And that's kind of what protects us. If at any point a certified interpreter is brought into court and has to prove that they actually qualify to do the job. Absolutely, thanks Natalia. Uh, Dini and Erissa, anything to add? Well, I'll definitely second everything that Mila and Natalia have said and insurance and vetting processes are incredibly important. And I would say vetting processes and qualifying interpreters is more ins important than insurance. Insurance you carry not to use it. And processes you continue to improve because requirements continue to change and be modified. So from that perspective, um, I agree with Natalia also, there have been a lot of lawsuits when interpreters were not utilized or when family members or no one or Google Translate were used. So um, I just wanna make this parallel. Um, we always talk about, oh, a family member was interpreting, unfortunately. And I think Natalia mentioned something about that um, in the language industry, it is fairly common to have who, someone who is not a professional interpreter still be involved. We don't see that with doctors, nurses, any other medical professionals. So we shouldn't be seeing that with interpreters either. And I think that's a really important point for everyone involved, including patients. But for that, they have to understand their language access rights and be empowered to enforce them. Great. Thanks, Jeannie. Rissa? So 
I'm going to say one last thing is that when you enter into the journey of becoming an interpreter, the first thing you learn is a code of ethics and standards of practice. And the first thing you learn is accuracy. And we make sure that all of our interpreters, everything that comes out of their mouth, they know they're liable for everything they're saying, not in terms to make them, you know, that this is something that can happen, but just to to, to differentiate a professional interpreter for just a bilingual person that can summarize or forget things or not mention things. That's why I totally agree with the ladies that if you use a professional interpreter, you will see the difference. The hospital see the difference. The patient sees the difference a lot when they use their family member or when they use an interpreter. So once that we come to a realization that professional interpreters are like everybody else in the healthcare that is a profession that shouldn't be substituted or shouldn't be, you know, let's pretend we have it. Um, everything else should be sure and reassured that the job is done well. And, and I want to add again one more point. I wouldn't be on this call if I wouldn't be talking about trauma informed. Uh, there is an epidemic right now due to obviously we're all now in the digital age. And after COVID, there is a, an epidemic growth of uh, human trafficking cases, uh, child abuse cases. And uh, obviously, we see as the, the globe, uh, global uh, increase in number of refugees due to, to conflict. Doctors are often on the front line of identifying those abuse cases and trauma cases. And for that reason, in the trauma-informed training, they are telling doctors to actually have the mother step out of the room, uh, have the father step out of the room, have the family member, even in pediatric encounters, step out of the room. And that's where professional interpreter comes very much uh, in play and is also additionally very important. And that is to identify properly cases of abuse. So not only it is important for accuracy of interpreting, it is important for saving lives, out of abuse and tra trauma situations, saving children to work with professional interpreters. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, given all this and giving the, uh, and there's two more topics we need to talk about is the, um, the competition, meaning that if I was a service provider and I understand now it takes certain qualification to become an interpreter, it takes a certain testing to become an interpreter, um, it is not just walk off the street and speak another language kind of an interpreter. It takes a lot of investment for you as a company and for me as a personal uh, or person as an interpreter to become an interpreter. Which, how do you balance, I guess the question becomes now, how do you balance between uh, your rates? Like, you know, somebody comes in and say, you know, I offer this for, I mean, we're seeing it in every service, right? And I'm assuming it is in your world as well where you're probably asking for X and your competitor are asking for 50% on the dollar or et cetera. So I don't know how you guys manage this, but what, how do you, how do you balance all this? Uh, and, and let's start with, uh, I guess with Mila, you since you had the microphone, I guess. Last. All right. Thank you. Well, first of all, I believe we're not allowed to talk about the race. Not themselves. Specifically, no, just the, uh, in general competition. We manage it by, by staying professional and by, we've actually increased rates in some cases. We are, uh, the, the people who are going to the rock bottom, the, the race to the bottom are doing disadvantage to, to the whole disservice to the whole profession. Uh, I believe, you know, it's very critically important to pay interpreters more to pay uh, and therefore to charge more. And so I'm actually going to open it up to the rest of, of, of the audience here. I think uh, it's uh, what we do when somebody undercuts us, we ignore it. And we say, we're gonna either lose that job completely, that's fine, but we're gonna stay firm because we believe in paying fair rates uh, to interpreters and to everybody who works. There's a whole large group of people who work in uh, talent acquisition, talent management, accounting, training, all uh, infrastructure that supports interpreters. Jeannie? Thank you. I agree. I absolutely agree. Race for the, to the bottom undercuts everybody in the profession. You can't have fast, good, and cheap. You can only pick two at the most. So we take out cheap. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely agree with Mila. 
we do uh, submit quite a bit of proposals and respond to various requests for quotes, requests for proposal, etc. And whenever we see um, that it is going to the lowest price, technically acceptable type of a, a scenario, we may either choose not to bid or bid at the rates that we think are fair. Okay. And sometimes we win, sometimes we lose, but we're not willing to compromise quality just to go to the lowest price. I don't think it uh, improves the profession from any angle. So uh, am I hearing that this is a, a company decision? You, you guys don't have like a national way of setting the rates. Like for instance, when I worked for the uh, work long time ago, I worked for an insurance company um, and uh, there was a fee guide, meaning that if you're a dentist um, and you're, um, you're having a root canal on one side of the country, you'll know how much it's going to cost you for a root canal on the other side of the country. It's the same dental fee guide may vary a little bit of up and down by the cost of living in certain states, but it's pretty much give or take the same rates. In this case, we're talking about individually company or individuals setting their own rates. Am I correct? There's no national way of setting rates for you as an interpreter, correct? In healthcare, yeah. for the most part, at least in my experience, I have never seen a, a standardized national guide. And it wouldn't work because different parts of the country have different uh, language requirements, different cost of leave, living, and therefore it would be detrimental to the industry. I have seen it in other verticals, but since we're focusing on healthcare yeah. here, I can I can stick to healthcare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Natalia. Well, and I think I think part of it is also because there is a workforce that are staff interpreters, right? And that kind of balances things out, especially in some, you know, states, uh, and I'll give examples like states of Washington, Oregon, California, who have, you know, higher um, requirements towards interpreters and the quality of interpretation. And they have, you know, a staff position, which would be higher paid than somebody in the middle of the country, right? So I think that also uh, creates this you know hard to compare and that's what makes our industry uh inter medical interpreting unique because there are some you know the some contracts and obviously there are big buyers of you know conglomerate buyers of interpreting services that then you know go out and you know bid uh, and then you sell it to individual health systems but it's still not a unified you know a bidding thing it's not like there are i think there are what maybe two or three big contractors like that who do aggregate uh purchasing of interpreting services and this another factor here is what irisa uh, keeps uh, bringing up is the fact that remote interpreting in the united states is still global it's not just purely local talent right and otherwise known as offshoring so whichever way you want to call it uh, and because of that of course the cost to employ uh, interpreters in the countries outside of the United States will be cheaper for some, for many languages, for most languages. The other thing to keep in mind, um, I would say like at least 80% of interpreting is Spanish in the United States. And for that, there is a huge demand and there is a huge opportunity to aggregate and to offshore more. So it's hard to compare. So if you're talking about interpreting of uh, Arabic, Burmese, uh, Ukrainian, it'll be a different story than interpreting in Spanish. So it's important for both purchasers and buyers to recognize that, and interpreters too, that you have more flexibility if you are a Ukrainian, Burmese, or Swahili interpreter than if you're a Spanish interpreter. Absolutely. There is anything to add yes. on? Yes. Oh my gosh, I have too many things to add. So uh, the first thing I want to say, the cost uh, differentiation, it's a huge factor in our industry, of course, especially uh, when we're talking about clients that still are not very, very much aware of the role of the interpreters. They think that as, as long as they are interpreters, they're everybody the same quality. I totally agree with Natalia that offshore, not only in this industry, but in all the industries, offshore is seen as an opportunity to reduce costs. And that is the case even in our industry. But the fact is 
that we are talking about interpreters and the quality and the standards should be the same no matter where they are located. The companies that provide outsourcing, and my company is one of them, it's suffering as well in this uh, cost reduction model because everybody feels like I can go and find resources in a like, slap of a moment, many resources at one time. But the idea is like, how are they vetted? How are they qualified? We're talking here like 40 minutes, 45 minutes about the standards, the quality, the practices. We have CCHI in the United States, but there is no CCHI outside of the United States. There is no standardization outside of the United States. So all of this makes that the cost outside is very cheap, but even the cheapest has to has a limit because that back uh, that comes back from the interpreters being frustrated, being unhappy, being demotivated because they feel the burden the most when it comes to the cost. So I think that there is no standard in our industry and in my experience as well uh, in terms of pricing, but should um, I agree with Mila and Jeannie that Every company should wait if they believe in their quality to not have to struggle right now in terms of, oh, let's reduce our cost as well, because this will come back because nobody will jeopardize the quality of the interpreting for just a, a reduction in price. At, at least I think nobody should, you know, in this matter in healthcare interpreting. And I guess I keep weighing in and adding up. Some countries are actually ahead of the U.S. on this. Australia's certifications and requirements are way ahead. Very often we will look up to them. Uh, you know, we have uh, UK, we have uh, different countries in Europe. And so when there are many countries that have very strict re uh, requirements, but some countries don't. I want to add one point. What we are seeing and what uh, uh, two things. One is an increased requirement for US only labor in the US and a lot of government and healthcare contracts due to confidentiality. But second is what is kind of alarming. Uh, we have been seeing cases both on the translation side where the uh, process, uh, companies are using uh, machines, AI or MT and um, then uh, post-editing and labeling that product as fully human. Uh, and the same thing we're seeing when sometimes companies offshore now labeling that product um, or uh, that service as fully onshore um, through certain loopholes that are uh, potentially available. Um, on that, right now, ASTM has a huge effort for written work on labeling and coming up with, with the process of labels where machine output will be required to be labeled. Great, and which brings me to the last point on, on this call today, and uh, thanks uh, Mila for driving us into the last point, is uh, AI and where is it being used now? What parts of your business is, is AI being used in? Obviously not all your business is uh, being, uh, use, using AI, but I'm assuming at some point in your process, we are using some parts of AI. Let's start with Mila. Okay, um, so thank you. Uh, we're uh, using AI or we're experimenting with AI because uh, machine translation and translation memory have been in the industry for years. So they're part of standards part of, of the process. Uh, we are uh, definitely using AI where we automate other parts of the business. Uh, processing of, of invoices, um, the uh, the parts of the business that can be automated that don't have to do with the linguistic component of the work. And at the same time, we're staying on top of the evolving technology and uh, experimenting and, and testing it. Uh, the types of encounters we are providing uh, for interpreting uh, we wouldn't feel right now ethically right to provide uh, machine interpreting for the for those types of encounters. Are we experimenting? Yes. So and automating manual portions. So let's say renaming faxes is done by machines. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, uh, let's say, Arissa, what, what do you think on the topic of AI? AI is everywhere. So, of course, the influence has been seen in our industry as well. So, in our company, we use AI in terms of because we are focused a lot on training our interpreters. So, we use AI to be a tool to help our interpreters to get familiar and also in terminology and also maybe as a resource to increase their terminology in specific areas or for specific scenarios, uh, uh, role plays that we have part of our training. But um, in terms of being afraid, because uh, in our profession has made uh, a big question mark if AI will substitute an interpreter, and uh, some people are afraid to enter into this journey because of the future. I think uh, I've heard it many times, and I, I second that opinion that if an interpreter is qualified, is specialized, is very good, I don't think AI will uh, catch up to that level. So I think we, in every profession, we have to stand up and we have to be better and uh, we have to combine our forces with AI. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's beneficial. Absolutely. Uh, Jeannie, where do you stand on the topic? Well, AI can be great or it can also be very helpful in process automation, in improving uh, outcomes, in running the business. Okay. So from that perspective, we use it, we research it, we look for new um, options, we implement it, um, and I expect that we will continue implementing it. Can it replace an interpreter and translator? Maybe in a distant future. We're not there yet. Just like I wouldn't believe and I wouldn't want Google Translate or LLM, ChatGPT, etc do my diagnosis if I go to a doctor, same way I don't want it to interpret for me or translate and have that raw output be out there. Mm -hmm. That would be my parallel. But uh, at Linguist Education Online, every co every conference that we have, we talk about AI a lot. Okay. And there are a lot of different opinions on the topic and some are afraid of it, some embrace it. But I think the reality is that Interpreters and translators need to understand it and embrace it because it's not going anywhere. Correct. And they can be replaced by another interpreter and translator who does use technology in a smart way. Correct. Natalia? Well, I have um, a couple of things uh, to bring us to our you know, audience's attention. The first thing is that um, there, in medical fields, there are a lot of regulations and laws. And so that would be the one thing that will preclude AI to be replacing human interpreters, because ultimately healthcare, as you said, is very, you know, uh, known for lit is known for litigation. So who is accountable? You're not going to hold an app or Apple, Google, uh, you know, uh, Meta accountable for misinterpreting something in that particular moment. Right. So for that very reason, and of course, seeing what is done in the uh, you know European Union uh, with the regulations that they think I'm thinking U.S. will follow that, and in medical, it will always be stricter than in any other industry. So if you're thinking from the perspective on AI developer, it's cheaper for them to go somewhere else, tourism, you know, all other things than to dab in medical, right? The other thing is, oftentimes we're forgetting the thing that, you know, we think interpreting is two-directional, right? Or three-directional, depending on how many people you have. Software engineers sometimes think interpreting is unidirectional, and that could be used in healthcare. Right. If you pre-record some messages in English and then have the opportunity to, you know, uh, automate, uh, you know, inter provide automation interpreting in 350 languages, and at some point somebody human will review those, absolutely, right. And that could be announcement. Mm -hmm fire in the building, right? Evacuate or shooter, unfortunately for our country, shooter in the building, right? So those unidirectional things are also technical. It could be called interpreting, but that's not what we talk about interpreting today when we involve it conversation. So that's where I see there could be a use of AI, but as far as the regular appointment, yep. We're not going to go there. I think even in 50 years, because too much is on at stake here. No doctor right. wants to lose their license mm -hmm. because of misinterpretation. And if AI hallucinates, 
who says that the term that they would suggest is a correct translation is actually correct. correct. Right. They, you know, I asked Chad GPT, can you provide me the source for this translation of this word? I said, well, I am just an automated app. I cannot provide you the source. Well, if you cannot provide me the source, then I need to do what? Go back and search and see whether that's the correct translation of that word or not. So, yeah, uh, I definitely, and of course, for CCH, I would not use AI because uh, we do want to own our exams. And right now, the uh, if something is not created by a human... Yeah. It's not uh, copyright. Excellent. So. Well, thank you so much, ladies. I really appreciate it. Um, we're coming up to the end of our conversation. I wish we had a little bit more time. There are a few other topics I would like to cover with you, but maybe we'll wait for another session. Um, you're always welcome. Uh, this channel is your channel. And for the audience, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, Natalia, Jeannie, and uh, Mila and Erisa, any last comments before I uh, stop the recording? <laughs> okay, I want to say that if you want to become an interpreter, don't hesitate, become an interpreter, start learning, start training, and then get certified because that what would distinguish you as a human professional that uh, is valued above uh, anything Thank else. you, Natalia. Jeannie? Leo 10, our 10th conference is coming up on December 5th and 6th. Would love to invite everybody to join. We'll have fascinating discussions for two days. And we'll be talking about AI for sure. Thank you, Jeannie. Larissa? Okay, so I'm going to go a little bit off the industry. And I just read an article that says that if we want to end the polarization worldwide, not just in the United States, we have to think like an interpreter. And I love it because we think two different cultures, two different languages, we communicate what is the right term, what is the right meaning. So I think that being an interpreter not only saves lives in healthcare, but also helps connect. And connection is what we're missing right now. So being an interpreter is, is worth it. Thank you, Risa. Um, I want to add that just like in every profession, uh, there is a shortage of qualified interpreters. Nationally today, there is a shortage of qualified interpreters, so please uh, continue with your journey of professionalization, and uh, we want to see more interpreters entering the profession. Uh, we, too, have very interesting training coming up on October uh, 18th. It's a full-day training. It's part of our Wellness Connection uh, multi-year series. It's Empowerment Through Connection, the role of external regulators in trauma integration. So not only interpreters interpret, showing the complexity of our work, we also act as external regulators. And that would be a very interesting topic for those who work with mental Absolutely. health. Absolutely. Well, thank you ladies again, one more time. Thanks to the audience uh, for attending or for listening in, uh, or viewing this uh, episode, episode number 78. From me and uh, the audience to the panel, thank you so much for your participation today. Really appreciate it. And thank you for your insights, for your input. And I've learned a lot. And I'm hoping that our audience learned a lot as well. And that's my second time talking to you. I feel like I, I'm learning something new every time I talk to you. So it's great to have you on the channel again. Um, me and the, on, on my behalf and behalf of the audience, thanks again for being part of this conversation. Don't go anywhere. Stay online. I'm going to stop the recording right now. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.